Happy to have you joining us for this year's Phi Kappa Phi lecture. I'm Jeremy Jackson. I'm a professor of economics in the Department of Agribusiness and, and Applied Economics. I also direct the Center for the Study of Public Choice in Private Enterprise, and I am the president of the NDSU chapter of Phi Kappa Phi. We also have several other members of our, of our board that I would like to introduce as well. Dennis Cooley is our acting treasurer. Elizabeth Crawford Jackson is our secretary. Suzanne Kelly is our past president. And Jim Deal is our past secretary. So before we get started, I do want to say a few things about what Phi Kappa Phi is. And Phi Kappa Phi, um, unlike other um, societies that carry Greek letters, is not a fraternity or a sorority. It is an honor society. So membership is not granted to all, but must be earned. Phi Kappa Phi members at North Dakota State University are among the highest and brightest achieving students in the nation. And we're, of course, at a university known for having high standards. And NDSU students invited to join at this level of academic performance typically represent about 3% of the university's student population. Um, initiation is an honor that gives you not only the right to wear a special recognition ribbon during graduation, but your achievement also becomes part of your permanent transcript. It is the only academic honor society eligible for that designation at NDSU. So if you're a student and receive an invitation to join, it is a high honor. In the past, the Phi Kappa Phi lecture has been preceded by our annual initiation ceremony. But this year, the initiation ceremony will be held on February 22nd, following the second Phi Kappa Phi lecture. The Phi Kappa Phi faculty lecture was established in 2015 by NDSU President Bresciani to recognize faculty whose outstanding high impact research, scholarship, or creative activity consistently supports NDSU's top tier research status and who have a proven ability to effectively present their research to a broad community in the land grant tradition. Each of our three finalists for this, our sixth annual Phi Kappa Phi faculty lectureship receive a modest financial award. And of course, our appreciation and admiration for their achievements. I want to congratulate the finalists who were considered for our award this year. So they include Dr. Bill Wilson, Distinguished Professor of Agribusiness and Applied Economics. Dr. Kalpana Kadi, Distinguished Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And Dr. Kadi will be given the second Phi Kappa Phi Lecture of the Year. Again, that's on February 22nd. And of course, Dr. Tom DeSutter, Professor and Soil Science Program Leader whom you're going to hear more about in a few minutes. Um, I also want to be sure that I thank Jean and Bill and Green, our Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and Equity, who facilitated the selection process and the arrangements for tonight's presentation. And following Dr. DeSutter's presentation, um, Dean Bresciani, President of North Dakota State University, will offer a few brief remarks. And now I want to welcome Dr. Greg Lardy, Vice President of Agricultural Affairs, to introduce Dr. Tom DeSutter, who will then present the first Phi Kappa Phi lecture for the year. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Phi Kappa Phi faculty lectureship. Dr. DeSutter received his BS and MS degrees from South Dakota State University in 1994 and 1998, respectively, and earned his PhD in 2004 from Kansas State University. After completing a postdoc with the USDA ARS in Ames, Iowa, he was hired in 2006 as an environmental soil scientist by the Department of Soil Science at North Dakota State University in Fargo. His primary research interests are saline and sodic soils, reclamation of energy extraction impacted soils, and instrumentation for measuring soil physical and biological parameters. Dr. DeSutter teaches soil and land use, as well as environmental field instrumentation and sampling. It's all yours, Tom. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, it's quite an honor to be here and to be selected, especially with the names that were, that were also mentioned. Uh, so to, so I'd, first, I'd like to thank the selection committee for, for choosing me for this award, and also the Office of the Provost for 
for sponsoring this faculty uh, lectureship. So today we're gonna to talk about a little bit what I would say or how I perceive to be the, the transformative power of soil. And I hope that you enjoy my story. I, I hope I invoke some questions in you and, and pique your interest more into what soil has to offer for us. So, so the one thing that we know is that our state has long recognized the importance of soil to its prosperity. As you can see on the, the coat of arms for our state, strength from the soil. And soil greatly influences the economy and is integral to North Dakota's $26 billion average annual contribution for agriculture. We are largely an agricultural state and the people who help us be prosperous are the farmers and ranchers of our state. So this is a, what would be a typical soil profile. I got yelled at, at a, I'm at a meeting one time that I, because I didn't show a soil profile, uh, but soil doesn't start out as, as soil like you see it. So this is an example of the Williams soil series. It's a very common soil. It's our, it's our state's unofficial state soil. And you can see on the, on the top, it's much darker. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about uh, soil as itself. And so, but soil transforms through the five soil forming factors, biology, climate, parent material, and, and uh, where, where it is on the topography, and the thing that we can never stop is time. Uh, so I want to let everybody know that I was a, an Eagles fan well before I became in vogue up in this region. So, so, the, so, the, so these five soil forming factors help define the properties that the soil will have, thus will dictate what the, the productivity potential of these soils will be. And it changes across the landscape and it changes across the state. One of the one of the uh, uh, philosophers of soil science, Dr. Les Henry, he's, he summarizes it even further, is that the, the most important soil forming factors are water and snow. Well, the reason he states that is that that is one of the properties, water is what dictates what, what e eventually the farmers will have to grow their crops. And so that's, that's one of the things that we always have to look at when we're thinking about reclamation is like, how do we manage the water? Because of the fact that we have, we live largely in a semi-arid environment in, in the Western part of the state where the annual rain, rainfall might be about 16 inches, but the atmosphere demands about 50 to 60 inches. So as soon as it rains and the sun comes out, the water is gonna to wanna to evaporate. So therefore it becomes very difficult to keep water in the soil. And that's why we, why it's one of the, one of the things that we, we most concentrate on when we're doing a reclamation work. So as we think about this though, the, really the gold of our state, it's not just in the emblems of NDSU, but it's also our soil. And so as FDR had stated, the nation that destroys its so soil destroys itself. So therefore what our programs try to do is to keep the conversation about dirt to a minimum and elevate it to about managing and uh, creating soil sustainability. But we, with everything, there's threats to this soil productivity. For example, compaction, meaning how, how if you have a soil and it becomes more, more, uh, more squished, salinization, how much, that's how much salts will be in the soil, erosion, uh, loss of organic matter, contamination, and loss of biodiversity. Now, these threats are not just in North Dakota, but they're around the world. And so when we, when we start doing research about soils, talking about soils, we oftentimes focus on these parameters because those are our greatest threats to food security. And some of these threats can be long-term where it might take years or decades to occur like soil salinization. So that's not snow, that is salt. And that's that salt that's on the soil surface 
in the southeast part of in a field in one of the in the southeast part of the state. And it doesn't taste like snow either. So, uh, and the other one is that that can happen very quickly. Is for example, is an oil spill. So the, this is a picture of what happened in Walsh County a couple of years ago, uh, and that's more on the day the order of days um, days to a week. So things can happen, but but part of our work is trying to trying to fix things or to improve them. So unfortunately, in the western part of our state. A lot of the times these threats happen very sudden. And oftentimes these threats come in the, are due to the fact that we have pipeline spills or other spills of what's called the produced water or the oil itself. And unfortunately, the, these types of headlines are still very common. So here's a map that one of my students developed and it shows the the, the, the Williston Basin at large, and then the Bakken and the Three Forks Reserves. And that's where most of our shale oil comes from is the Bakken the, and the Three Forks. So each of those dots represents the number of well pads in a 20 square miles. And 20 square miles is about the size of Moorhead. So you have in some areas greater than 60 well pads in the footprint of Moorhead. So, that seems like a lot, but you know it's a, but it's, you know it's a big area. So, if we think about it, then, so the oil in itself is in the the shale formation, and therefore the how they get at that oil is through uh, through drilling, but then horizontal drilling, and then they they frack that shale layer. And what they're doing is they're basically putting charges down and breaking it apart and pushing sand into those fractures. And then it, then that, that sand holds the, the shale apart and then the oil can move, move uh, much more readily. So that's one of the things that, uh, that has really expanded the oil production in our state. So then when the oil gets to the, comes up through the pump jack, it, uh, it is, goes through a treater it goes, it can either be brine at that point, which is the, the produced water, or it can be the oil in itself. And most all of the product that we have is transferred through pipelines at some point. And if you look back at those pictures or the, the, the headlines that I showed, most all of the accidental releases were due to pipeline, something that had to do with a pipeline. And therefore, that's why we spend a lot of our time thinking about pipeline, uh, the impact that, uh, and a, a spill might have in those areas. So again, we're, we're talking about the two products that we talk about were brine and, and, uh, and oil. So again, I wanna reiterate is that because of our, our, where our oil is situated, it was basically old ocean. And that's the, the brine is very, very salty. And that's because it's concentrated ocean water. And therefore, uh, when it comes up, it can have very drastic effects on the land. So one of my students, uh, the, they, they did a literature review. They found over 10,000 actual uh, data points. The average salinity was 313. And what, a, what this means, it is basically saturated solution of sodium chloride. Okay, so that's basically just, you know, how we used to make salt crystals when we were younger. This is basically what the concentration of that brine is. Now, take that into comparison. The, the, the salinity at this beach at the St. John, U.S. Virgin Island, I can attest to this, was 55. So you can think about it as 55 versus over 300. That's almost five times greater salinity concentrations. Therefore, when, when these spills occur, they can be very, very devastating on the soil and the plant life. So let's talk about the, the oil for just a second. So the Bakken crude is considered a light oil, okay? Very, very light. So it has a specific gravity. If you look on the, the y-axis, one being the density of water, it is less than the density of water. So if, it, if there is a spill, it will float. Okay, it will float. Take that as uh, in comparison to 
the tar sand oil that, that flows through the, the Keystone pipeline, the one that had the accidental spill in Walsh County, that is very heavy. And it's, and it's, uh, it would actually sink it, if in fact it was in water. So how they get it to move in the pipeline is they, they dilute it with a condensate, which is a byproduct of the natural gas industry. And therefore they get it fluid enough where it'll move uh, through the pipe. So that has a big difference though when you have a spill because the heavy stuff won't move very much because it's, it's so thick. But the Bakken in itself is so thin that it will find every pore in the soil and move through it. And that is what happened in 2013. So one of the largest oil spills in the United States occurred north of Tioga. The landowner was uh, harvesting his Durham wheat, one of our most important um, commodity crops in our state, and came across this oil spill. And it was due to a, a small leak in a pipeline. And that had been leaking for quite a while, and it ended up being about 20,000 barrels. So just over, just almost a million gallons of oil. And because it was so thin, and because it was, it was under pressure, it moved all over the place. And it, it mostly moved in the subsoil, so all the way down to 50 feet or so. And therefore, it, it was very, trying to find it took a lot of sampling to find where the plumes were, because it just moved all over. And so I, the X that I have marked there, I want you to keep that in your head because that's where we're gonna go back to the same point all the time. So we did not do the remediation of this contamination. A company out of Canada came down, they, they did what's called thermal desorption. This allowed them to, to basically heat up the soil to 700 degrees Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes. Then it would, it would uh, it would, the hydrocarbons would, would be, be driven off. The hydrocarbons would then go through this oxidizer, it would convert into carbon dioxide, and then it would be, and then the, the, the resulting product was a, a soil that was dialed in to have a total hydro, hydrocarbon concentration of less than 1,000, which deemed acceptable uh, by the state. So this unit, each of those buckets from that, that payloader was five tons. And there were over a million tons that were treated. So it took years to get this, uh, to get this done. Now we came in as, as, as researchers to investigate what, can we use this thermally desorbed soil again for crop production? That was one of our main objectives for being there. So if we look back in 2015, we looked at the early stage. Now we're kind of moving in time a little bit. There's that, that red X. It kind of grew in, in size and scope, right? They ended up finding uh, plumes that were underneath the pipeline that they already routed. They had to find all that. They had to dig all that out. And again, down to 50 feet in uh, some places. It was, uh, it was the, the greatest ski slope in Montreal County for quite some time. Um, I don't know if anybody actually skied, but but that would have been the, a, uh, and, if, and if you like dune buggies, it would have been a perfect place for that too. It was, it was wild, so. So, but I want you to pay more attention to this one right now. So this is the, this is the, the homestead for the family. So a lot of these farms out in the Western part of the state across North Dakota are generational. This means a lot to people. The soils and the land in those areas mean a lot to people. And that was something that, that came very evident to me through this project. I was riding with the landowner and we were riding along, we we're talking about reclamation, the research, and we were right next to these buildings. And she turned to me and said, I feel responsible for this land. It was at that point, I felt empowered to do my job because what that allowed me to do is to think about this as not so much a bunch of experimental designs, but we're actually gonna really help people. We're gonna help people bring their land back to productivity. And for me, that was very empowering. That was one of the things that really, it, it, it transformed me, if you will, because I was able to find a purpose of driving six hours one way to, 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 to do this work. And I can't thank the landowner enough for sharing that with me. I mean, it's, it means a lot when somebody invites you into their home for a meal. And that was one of the things that really stuck with me was, 
was the relationships that we were able to build during this project. So I came up with this quote, the transformative power of soil lies within research, teaching, and service to improve the lives of North Dakota stakeholders, citizens, and students. So this is something that I really believe in. I believe that, that we as a, as a group or we as an institution or we as stewards, we're able to empower people through education, but using soils as a, that, that vehicle. Because that is one thing that all of the landowners have in common is that threat. And if we can, if we can bring the attitude of, of it, it not being dirt, but actually to being soil that we can actually, that we're, 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 gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna protect it or we're gonna manage it, that conversation gets a lot more elevated at that point. So that was one of the things that was really evident to me as we moved through these projects was the important and, and the passion that people have for their soil and the passion they have for their land. And I think that was, for me, a lot of that was very transformative. So let's go on to our story again. Again, there's the, there's the red X. You can start, you see it's getting a little bit bigger. The original size was about seven to eight acres, they figured. But once they started digging and moving things around, it ended up being about 77 acres that had to be uh, reclaimed. And that was part of our work was to, was to come up with solutions for this reclamation to bring this land back to productivity. So keep an eye on, those, on that, where that, where that uh, arrow is. That's gonna be a, our next topic of discussion. Those are plots that we had, that we had built. So to test our, our research questions, to test our hypotheses, what we had done was we had plots that were built that were like 50 feet by 50 feet, three feet thick, and they had different, different materials. So for example, the A that you see, that is non-contaminated topsoil. The, the TDU, that is material that has gone through the thermal desorption unit. And the, and the SP, that is the stockpile. And that, is, that, that was a soil that was contaminated subsoil. It had a hydrogen, total petroleum hydrogen concentrations of greater than 2,000 uh, parts per million. So one of the things that we're interested in was there's, a, there's, a, there's not a lot of extra topsoil in the western part of the state. There was when there was a lot of Walmarts being built, a lot of hotels being built, but that's not happening anymore. So, we, so there's not an overabundance. So we were trying to figure out if we can use these thermal desorption, the stockpile, and dilute them one-to-one -one with topsoil, can we get the same result as if we were using 100% topsoil? And that's important because there's not a lot of, like I said, there's not a lot of extra topsoil. And we were trying to make sure that, that we can provide recommendations for the state and the landowners down the road. So one of my favorite pictures though is on the, is on the right. You can see all the different colors. And that was the, the darker color was the non-contaminated. You see the orange, that was the stuff that was uh, thermally desorbed. And then you see the very light color, which is the subsoil. And that has almost zero, uh, or it has zero organic carbon in it. So this was the cropping sequence uh, throughout the, the four years. We had wheat, peas, wheat, and uh, the grain sorghum. So I'm, I'm not gonna go through a lot of the results, but I wanted to share a few of the highlights uh, for everyone. You know, you think about those threats that we talked about, the loss of organic carbon, contamination, and loss of biodiversity. These were three of the things that we really tried to, tried to hit on. And one of the things was very evident that the lower the organic carbon that you have in your soil, the lower the yield. And therefore, it really brings into the point of soil conservation. Because if you let your, if soils become eroded and you lose that topsoil, you will see a decline in, in yields, guaranteed. So that, that was one of the things that we were able to, uh, to prove out. So contamination, if in fact you had a contaminated soil with Bakken crude, we want to determine how long would it take for that to degrade by itself. And what, it, what we ended up learning was, even if you just left it on the surface, it would have still taken 500, 500 days basically to go from one concentration to half of that concentration. 
So it takes quite a bit of time. But it is a possible uh, remediation strategy. And then loss of biodiversity. So one of the things that Zach has been working on is, is looking at, so there's a, there's an abuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So basically it means this fungus will associate with a plant root. The fungus can, can get, have a lot more surface area. It can bring in nutrients to the plant. One of the things that we learned was, was that the, in our most degraded soil that we have after four years, the concentration of this fungus was the greatest. So what this means is that the system is trying to overcompensate for, for the lack of nutrients in these soils by becoming more diverse, becoming more populated. And we're pretty excited about, about those results. But at the end of the day, as long as topsoil was mixed in, crop productivity was, was pretty much equal. So whether it was a one-to-one -one dilution or whether it was 100% topsoil, everything was about the same. Okay, this is the spring of 2019. The site had already been reclaimed. Everything was back to what we would term basically normal. And what we've, it looked really good. So we're, we're very happy. Our recommendations, our research provided the recommendations for, for the reclamation of those soils that were highly disturbed in that 77 acres. So, so we're very proud of all the work that we did. Uh, and certainly a lot of the the graduate students were very much a part of all of this. We ended up getting about 11 publications out of this, out of this research so far, which has been one of the most uh, productive projects that I've ever had. If you wanna find out more information about this project in itself, we do have a podcast um, that I encourage you to, to, uh, to listen to. So one of the things that through this project we worked really close with the oil and gas industry. We worked very close with the, the Department of Environmental Quality, and we worked very close with the landowner. One of the things that was very evident early on when we were making trips out west was that soil tended to be known at different levels across these groups. And for, and for reclamation to advance, in my opinion, everybody has to have about the same level or at least get to the same level so everybody's talking the same. The, the only other way to do it is to have regulations that are hard and fast that have defined metrics. Right now, there are guidelines for reclamation for oil and gas, oil spills and brine spills, but there's no hard and fast regulations. So, so the easier way would probably be to elevate the, the, uh, the knowledge level of everyone, empower them to, to then have a, the same conversation such that soil is protected and groundwater is protected. So, so that was one of the things that we really spent a lot of time thinking about and trying to figure out what the best way was to empower landowners to educate the oil and gas industry. Because you got to remember, not everybody has a PhD in soil science, right? You have, you have business people, you have lots of engineers, and a lot of times it is thought about as dirt. But from the farmers and ranchers, it's their livelihood. It's their goal. So that's where we want to get everybody to, to try to get at that same, same sort of level. Okay, so we also worked on brine spills and we also worked on these, these pipelines. And one of the things that, uh, one, one of the most difficult reclamation things in the state is, is brine spills. As you, so in this, in this diagram, you have you have like the sodium and the chloride, like I talked about, remember how highly concentrated it was. You get this into a region in the soil, basically soil biology goes away, the plants go away, and you end up with this very big scarring on the landscape. Now, ideally for reclamation, what you would like to do is flush those salts down through the soil profile, capture them in some sort of tile drainage, and then remove that product into safe disposal, okay? Back to what I said before. This is a semi-arid environment, 16 inches of rainfall, 50 inches of potential evapotranspiration, meaning as soon as the sun comes out, that water is gonna wanna move into the atmosphere. It becomes very, very difficult to leach water through these soils. And so therefore we're trying to think about different ways to do this. And one of my, you know, cause we wanna get away from this 
and get it back to some level of productivity. The most common way of doing it is what's called dig and haul. And this is a way that, that they delineate the spill, they dig it out, they bring it to an approved landfill and new, new soil, new soil is brought in. And there's no real requirements for what this new soil might be. But what we've learned is like landowners really want their own soil. They would like to keep what they have because they know what they have. They obviously don't want the, the contamination, but they want what they, what they already own. So this brings us, you know, we, to the point where we tried lots of different things. We tried amendments, we tried everything but the kitchen sink, if you, if you will. And it's very, very difficult and it's very, very hard. And we were not successful. So it always reminds me of this quote. If you don't do big, if you don't think big, you don't do big things. Whether it's a big problem or a small problem, you may spend the same amount of time on it. So why not take the big problem that moves society forward? Okay, so we're paid and we're expected to think big, right? If we just do the status quo all the time, we're not advancing science. So we, I feel is that our responsibility is to push the limit. So that's what we've been trying to do in the, in the brine circle is to push that limit. So one of the things that we know that we can't fight is evaporation, as I spoke about. So then, so my colleague and I, we were, we've spent a lot of time on thinking about this. It's like, how do you get salts to move up? How do you get them to pull them up out of the soil and then take them away? So, so my colleague was working on this uh, crystal inhibitor I'm working on this, uh, what we call wicks. So basically if you had wicks in the soil, you could, you could, the salts would move into the wicks, the water would evaporate, the salts would stay in the wick. You could take the wicks and you could throw them away. And therefore you take in the salts out of the soil. So we did this proof of concept, uh, uh, one of my graduate students, where we looked at all these different wicks. We looked at uh, cellulose wicks, straw, um, and after 35 days, we were able to, using this, the cellulose wicks with subsurface irrigation, we were able to remove 80% of the salt in those soils. Okay, this is pretty good proof of concept. And we're very, very excited about, about what the possibilities are for that. So this is, so we got a, through this project, we I probably, you know, we've got a couple of research papers on it. Uh, uh, Aaron Green was the graduate student. He did a wonderful review of literature on brine spills and cleanup. And I encourage you, if anyone is interested in that to, to please contact me and we will uh, make sure that you get that copy of that. So, that we, we, so we're also working with mechanical engineers here on, here on campus, trying to find these different wicks, which wicks might work better than others, which are available, which, which can be installed. Because that's part of the big part, you know, this big thing is, is you come up with this idea, it's a moonshot idea, but then you still have to have the application and how is it going to really work? That's, you know, that's what we also struggle with is making sure that it's what we do can be used. But I think we've gotten to the point now where unfortunately due to the summer activities, we weren't able to install things in the field, but we're hope, hopeful uh, for next summer that, that uh, we'll be able to do that. So I have another graduate student work on electrokinetics. So basically what this is, is, is you have anodes and cathodes in the soil. And because sodium is positively charged and chloride is negatively charged, you can pull those ions to their oppositely charged electrode. So you don't have to do any dig and haul. You can, you can put a charge in the soil and just pull, just pull the ions to those locations and then dispose of those appropriately. He's had a very, very good, a good success with this. And part of his dissertation will be, will be doing some modeling and also be doing some, uh, some more uh, field work with this, but really exciting stuff. Uh, some of the things that, you know, like I said, moonshot, you know, how do we help, how do we help that landowner bring their land back to productivity? That's, a, that's our ultimate goal. So with respect to the pipelines, you know, you're flying over, this is kind of the 20,000 or 30,000 foot view. You can see all of the, 
the well pads. You can see the gorgeous Missouri River, the bluffs. Um, so this is just east of Williston. Uh, if you take 1804, that's a, a scenic route that Lewis and Clark would have taken up. And you can take 1806 back when they, uh, when they came back. Um, but you can see, you can barely see these from, from that view. But if you get to ground level, this is what it looks like. And this is just a natural uh, progression of the oil and gas industry. You have products, you have to move them. Pipelines are one of the safest ways to move those. But there is some soil disturbance that occurs during that process. So they have to strip all the topsoil back and, and throw it off to one side. They dig a trench, they put the topsoil on one pile and then the subsoil on another pile. They lay the pipeline, put the, top, put the subsoil on, put the topsoil on, and then regrade the whole thing. And that area that you see that is bare, that oftentimes gets driven on quite a bit through all the mechanical uh, construction and the, all, the, all, all the machinery. And that's where a lot of the problems that we see come from. And that's the, the compaction. So here's, a, here's an example of, it's not my, not my work, but it's, but it's very descriptive. The one on the left would be the a soil that has good pores. All, all, that, all that white stuff in there is the pores. It has really good porosity. But the one that's compacted on the right, there's hardly anything. And so, so you got to think about this from the roots perspective, the water moving it through it, the gases moving through that soil, and how difficult and how much decrease in productivity that soil will have due to that, uh, that compaction. So here's an example of what it will look like in the field. This is an alfalfa root that was doing just fine, hit that compacted layer in that, that right of way along that pipeline, and, and it took a right turn. Alfalfa is a tough plant. It can root down, you know, three, four, five, six feet, but not when the soil is that compacted. And that's one of the things that, that we spend a lot of time trying to alleviate. So some of, of Nick's work that he's been working on is trying to, how do we, how do we improve the ability for those plants to, to root? Because what you don't want is what's in the roadway where you're actually only farming four to six inches of soil, topsoil. Out west, when you have subsoil moisture, you need those roots to get down as deep as they can. And so, so in the roadway, we oftentimes see a much decrease in productivity. So one of, the, one of the things that Nick's project has been doing is looking at ripping the soil. So basically subsurface tilling the soil. You're not turning it over per se, but you're sort of lifting it up and fracturing it. And we've seen really good results with, with, uh, with that, uh, that approach because you don't want to be farming again four to six inches you want to be able to farm at least 18 to 24 inches so one of the other things that we're working on is with the pipelines is erosion trying to figure out the best ways to reduce the amount of erosion that that may occur and so this is a project that that one of my students is working on we just got it going here this fall so we don't have any any results per se but rest assured by the time, basically when I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed, I'm constantly thinking about new ways and, and new uh, research projects that we can do to answer some of the questions. Because I go, always go back to what Patty, or excuse me, what the landowner had told me was, I feel responsible for this, for this land. And, and I, I can't thank her enough for sharing that because it, it really has, has changed me. So one of the other things that, that really became evident during this whole time, I was fortunate to go through a leadership training uh, through the College of Agriculture. And one of the things that they had us do was, why do you do what you do? And this was probably the most, I don't say uplifting, but it was the most eye-opening thing that I had done in a long time. So, so you have to go through all these questions uh, what do you choose to stand up for, advocate, protect? What makes you happy, pleased? Uh, what are the values? What do you, careers you've had? And, and all the stuff that males love to talk about. It's like, oh, Kimmy, let me throw out my feelings one more time. But it was a really good process. And, and for me, because my, my dad was a carpenter, he always built, I, I was 
I do a lot of my own construction. I do a lot of instrumentation. I build fishing rods, which is important. And then, so I came up with this building is empowering. So what that is, is building up graduate students, building up the people you work with and empower them with knowledge. And that's in the essence of, I see that my, the poster in my office every day. And, and I truly believe that that has, one of the reasons that I've been successful, because I, I really do believe that we are here to empower people, at, whether it's in soils and chemistry and physics or biology, but that is part of our job. And I take that, that part of my job very seriously. So one of the things that allows me to do is to work with landowners. I, we, we talk with landowners, we show them, we dig holes, uh, we do everything we can to help empower them with, uh, with knowledge. And it was all because of that one hole in that pipeline that I got out there. And I don't think there's any, any reason to believe that that, that that was a good thing. But for me, from a professional standpoint, it was one of the best things that, that, that has ever happened to me. And what that has allowed us to do is to get our, get our footing out there and build trust. So one of the, I really have to thank my colleagues, Miranda Meehan, she's in the Department of Animal Science, and then uh, uh, Chris Augustine, he's the director of the, the Dickinson Research and Extension Center. They're, they're extension at heart, and they're very good at, at creating and building these groups for people to talk to. So one of the things was we had these meetings where we had landowners, we had oil and gas personnel, we had us, and then we had the Department of, of Environmental Quality, all in the same room talking about reclamation. And that's a lot of, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. There's usually groups or pods and they, and they go their way or they may not take the in consideration of the other group. And I think, you know, there were some heated arguments, don't get me wrong, they were never uh, towards, towards NDSU, um, but it allowed that, that avenue of people to speak. And I think that, was, that is something that, that, that we certainly don't do enough of, you know, uh, is let's just talk about it, right? Let's just see what's, what's, let's bring people together. And I think our institution is, is very good at doing that. And part of the other thing was, I've, I've been able to lend my expertise. I'm on the, the uh, environmental council for the Department of Environmental Quality. I was asked to be on that um, by the governor. And I feel like I have a place at the table. Soils has a place at the table. And I, I greatly appreciate that offer to, to be on that council. Okay, so let's go back to our quote. So the transformative power of soil lies within research, teaching, service to improve the lives of North Dakota stakeholders, citizens, and students. And what I want to throw in there, though, is me. Because I think this was very transformative to me. I mean, this whole process of, of being able to help, right? We always like to help people, but I think I found my place. And I think, you know, it's not just me trying to help people better understand soils, better understand reclamation, but they're also helping me be a better husband, be a better supervisor, be a better colleague. So, so for that, I'm very appreciative. So there's, uh, I hope you enjoyed the story. It's, uh, there's a lot more to tell, but, but I think that that gives, gives everyone a taste. I have a lot of people to thank. I, I tried to put them all in this picture. The size of the picture doesn't, doesn't mean you are a greater, uh, more important to me or not. Um, I do want to point out that, that the, 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 the landowners that we worked with were some of the best people that, that I've ever met. And, and, and I greatly appreciate, appreciate everything that they've done for me. So, and I also want to thank, uh, thank my wife, uh, Carrie, who's in the audience tonight, and then our, our puppy, Ellie. Uh, she's ready for me, to, us to both be home. So, so we're going to wrap this up here soon. So lastly, when you're ever in the Memorial Union, you're walking downstairs, look to your right, and you can see this piece of art, okay? So the artist at some point had, had also known the importance of soil to our state, so. So with that, I will take any questions.
So, and I have a, in my class, I have a, an app that, that w when nobody does anything, I can hit it and it's either laughing or clapping. So I'll never walk past pretend I'm hitting that right now. That's oh, sure. I don't know what it means. It's in the union right by the stairs going downstairs. Hmm. I know that sculpture. Say, hey, Tom, this is uh, Berlin Nelson. Can you hear me? Yes, Berlin. Nice to hear yeah. your voice. Tom, when they, when they uh, following that oil spill, you said that some of it actually went down about 50 feet. That's correct, sir. So did they, did they actually excavate the soil down to 50 feet? Yes, they did. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And of course that was closer to the groundwater. So the, so that increased the risk of contamination, the deeper it got. So it actually became more important to get it when it was deeper than when it was shallow. Oh, I see. So they, they have they, did they already finish doing all of the uh, remediation of that heat treatment? Correct. Yep. That, that was done in about the end of 28. Well, actually, uh, yeah, 2018, uh, 2019. Yep, oh. that's correct. And so that field is now done. Does it grow or crop it? Yes, it's uh, fully cropped. Uh, good news. Uh, it's, it's yielding about the same. So. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Gee. Sure. Hi, Tom. There's a question in the chat from Dinesh Khadi. Um, the concept of electrokinetics remediation is similar in concepts to electrochemical hardening to improve mechanical properties of soils by inserting anode and cathode and lime piles to disperse calcium ions to bind the clay particles and improve soil properties. The power requirements are high, making this technique difficult to implement. How much is the power requirement and the efficiency of contaminant removal using the electrokinetic technique? Uh, so that's a very good question. And uh, I expect nothing less from Dr. Cotty. Um, but the, most of the system is run on, on solar panels. So it doesn't have a lot of uh, charge requirements as compared to bringing in a 220 or 110. So, so I'm gonna leave it at that for now. I don't wanna uh, overextend my knowledge just, in the, just at this time. So, but but it, it's something that, that, uh, that, that we can discuss soon if she's, a, if she's willing. There's also a question from Juan Osorno. Did you try any other crops besides sorghum? Yeah, so we tried, uh, we, we had wheat. Wheat is commonly grown out there, so that was, that was a no-brainer. Peas are commonly grown in that region. The problem with, that we had with the peas, it was 2017, and that was when we had this terrible, terrible drought out west. So, so we ended up harvesting it as, as biomass and not as grain, and then we did wheat again uh, in 20. 18, so. Please feel free to speak up if you have a question you would like to ask. Try the high flex model there. The president has a question. I have to answer it. So the question is, what is the, what is the most important thing that we've learned, and what is the next step, basically? So the most important thing is to keep water in the soil. Now, I don't mean to the point of flooding, but the point of of where because if you have enough water, the the roots can penetrate the soil just a little bit better, and that's one of the things that we're really trying to really trying to work on is. How do you modify the soil surface to keep the evaporation down, but also make it practical for people to use? So in many parts in semi-arid regions, they'll use snow catch in the winter to actually put a lot of uh, soil water, or a lot of water back into the soil. And that's something that is not done regularly on pipelines, 
but we think we're trying to we're, we're trying to figure out on a some sort of cropping system or way that we can get that water trapped and then use it later on because most of the a lot of the plant germination and growth happens in the spring and for, for, for example if you wanted to have oats as a cover crop well that needs to happen in the spring if it's too dry and too hard you're not going to get a great establishment so so that's the area that we're mo moving towards is, is trying to get figure out how to get more and more water back into that soil irrespective of the soil texture but also of the the landscape position so Absent any additional questions, perhaps we would like to go ahead and have President Bresciani join, join you on the stage for a few remarks. Well, Tom, this, this is the part where we normally would have the spectacular 10 foot high trophy. We hand it to you uh, for winning this, this competition, if you will. But at the same time, really, wow. This is exactly what this faculty lectureship was created for. You know, and I, I, I lost a story in, if you will, but I, I, I always have to mention in 1862, a senator from Vermont and the president of the United States had a vision for creating a system of higher education in this country that would untap its natural resource potentials and what at the time was largely unexplored two thirds of the country. Um, and, and obviously by modern standards, we'd have a different way of evaluating that. But nonetheless, in 1862, to have a vision for how do we unlock that? And the presentation you just gave was a locksmith's answer of how do we tap into and take advantage of the capacities, the farming capacities of our country. How do we take advantage of them when we spoil those capacities? And it's exactly, I think, what Abraham Lincoln and Justin Merle had in their mind is using higher education to unlock and solve the problems that were keeping, uh, that were constraining the, the economic capacities of our country. And to this, to, to fast forward to today and hear a presentation like this, that we literally still have our hands in the soil unlocking those problems. And it was a terrific presentation. It was an articulation of that vision from 1862. And uh, I just want to thank you and thank everyone here. I want to wave to Provost uh, Fitzgerald in the back there uh, and your wife as well for, for joining us this evening. Um, we did have a, a nice audience online. Uh, but still, I would have loved to have had them all in the room to, to feel the energy of your presentation. It was very exciting. I would shake your hand and hand you the 10-foot high trophy right now. We're just going to symbolically do that. But thank you for an absolutely outstanding presentation and, and frankly, for the contribution your work represents to the success of our state. Thank you.